Top Med Talk. Hello and welcome back to Top Med Talk. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host and also co-editor-in-chief of Top Med Talk. Now, in case you haven't heard of us before, this is your first time listening. Top Med Talk is a perioperative medicine podcast. It is listened to in over 100 countries, so we are global. And over the last six years, we have had over 2 million downloads, and we have recorded and broadcast over 2,000 podcasts. So lots of great recordings and interviews, conversations for your listening edification. You can find a ton of topics from the perioperative medicine space, including everything from pre-op, prehabilitation, intra-op monitoring and patient safety, post-op monitoring, uh, living the dream, drinking, eating, moving around ERAS, all of those topics you can find at Top Mind Talk. So do check us out. So on Top Mind Talk, we have conversations with global leaders in the field of perioperative medicine. And today's conversation is no different. So our next conversation today is continuing that conversation around patient safety. This is something that um, we have spent a lot of time discussing, and I think it, we still can talk more about it. And so today we have our guest, Dr. Steven Greenberg from Endeavor Healthcare in Chicago. Steven, it's so wonderful to have you back here on the podcast. You are a fan fave. Uh, I think our last one though, we, we recorded during COVID. So it's been a little while. Thank you so much for coming back and chatting with us. Thank you for having me, Desiree. And I just want to thank your organization for doing so much to inform people around the world about what's new in safety and in medical care. So thank you for all that you do. Steve, for those who may not know you, tell us a little bit more about you know where you practice, what type of practice you come from, um, and maybe some of the organizations that you're involved in. Absolutely. So I am an anesthesiologist and intensive care practicing physician at a healthcare system in mainly the north side of Chicago called Endeavor Health. We re- recently renamed our health system. Yeah. And we're now a nine hospital system. Uh, the last time we talked, we were only four hospitals, so we've doubled in size and in scope. And I particularly am focused on being the vice chair of research in our anesthesia department and education. So that's really been my focus in the last few years of really focusing on safety research and outcomes. As a someone who loves safety, years ago, as I talked about about four years ago, I have been heavily involved in the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, which is really near and dear to my heart. I'm currently vice president of the organization and also editor of the APSF newsletter, and just really uh, delighted to be a part of such an incredible multidisciplinary, multi-professional family. Yeah. And I think we talked quite a bit about um, the APSF and the the newsletter. Uh, And I I do, I want to dive into that Uh, before. So just so people know, because they may look you up and see Endeavor was formerly known as, or at least the organization where you were was formerly known as North Shore, right? That's how a lot of us know. Yes. North Shore University Health System. Yep. Yes. Okay. And and what are some of the particular research interests that you have? Um, I, I, I obviously leading research there, but is there anything in particular that you have been uh, looking at there or working with your your teams? Yeah. For so several years, we've been focusing on um, outcomes as it relates to residual neuromuscular blockade. And that's one of the reasons why I got involved with the APSF in two thousand seven. One of my colleagues and mentors got me involved with the specifics of how to improve outcomes by reducing residual neuromuscular blockade. So we have an ongoing prospective randomized trial looking at that in in cardiac ICU patients. In addition, uh, we have 13 other studies, uh, including uh, reducing opioid use in the perioperative uh, period, particularly in patients undergoing hiatals, hernia surgery, as well as comparing uh, pumps, infusion pumps, and the safety and efficacy of a variety of pumps. So that's just a, a couple things. We're also looking at using more non-narcotic uh, analgesics in uh, breast cancer patients and other patients, patients to really reduce the unwanted uh, risk of dependency um, and also respiratory depression. 
Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic work. I always love to hear. And every time we talk, I'm like, what are you working on now? <laughs> so I think it's uh, it's always good to cover. Yeah, I think a lot of us in, in the world of anesthesia probably are very familiar with the APSF. That's something, a, a newsletter that's used to be in our mailboxes all the time, uh, now in our emails. Why don't you tell us uh, just a little bit more about that organization, how the newsletters work and the communication? Because quite honestly, I didn't realize whenever I was it younger anesthesia professional, really the reach of what the APSF has? Yeah. So um, the APSF was the first ever U.S. Patient Safety Foundation founded in 1985. And it really um, sort of has been the trailblazer for safety in the United States. And uh, that happened really back in the early 80s with the increase in standard monitoring for perioperative care, which really came out of leaders and creators of the APSF. And so um, from that 1985 era, uh, we have continued uh, to really focus on what anesthesia professionals really need to hone in on in terms of proving our patient and provider safety. And so we developed these top 10 patient safety priorities through a modified Delphi technique that was uh, voted on by our board of directors, which, by the way, is a unique group, and the fact that it's multi-professional, multidisciplinary. And so we really engage the whole perioperative care provider model um, to really figure out what everybody is fo- one needs to focus on. So the, the last, I would say, five or six years, we've really focused on enhancing um, outcomes, education, research as it relates to those safety priorities. And so most of the articles that we published in the newsletter are really focused on those priorities. About four years ago, we talked about the international campaign. And one of the big missions for the APSF is really to exchange ideas and education around the world. And the last time I was here, we had about four or five uh, translated languages. We're now up to about nine languages. We're going to release Korean language. We have a partnership with the Korean Society of Anesthesiology. And that should be in the next couple of months. So that will be our ninth language. So we've really blossomed in terms of providing what we think are really high level articles for a large constituency. And so while we're not in paper form, uh, you actually can sign up for our electronic subscription. And that's actually growing on our website, www.apsf.org. So, yeah, that's what I was going to say. We're definitely going to give a plug for that. So if you're not signed up for it. You know, we have a lot of listeners who may not be doing anesthesia, surgeons, uh, nurses, administrators, a lot of residents uh, and students out there. And it is a really fantastic resource. And we have a lot of listeners as well who are from low to middle income countries. And one thing I love about the newsletter and the content that the APSF puts out there, it really is geared to anyone delivering surgical care, you know, from that perioperative world, no matter where you are, there's always things that we can, um, we can, you know, get glean from uh, the articles that you guys produce. So I I just want to say a job well done on that. It's, I I feel like you're very intentional about doing that. Yeah. And I think the important thing is the exchange idea um, that we can learn from one another. It's not the U S authors providing education purely on a one sided wavelength. It's, it's all of us. And there have been yeah. a variety of folks from around the world who have brought great ideas to the newsletter and published it that have created some initiatives um, back here in the United States and, and vice versa. And so uh, I think that's really um, what makes the APSF newsletter unique. It's the, you know, international exchange of ideas in many different countries. And, and yeah. so we allow and we actually welcome folks uh, who have safety ideas to publish and to write about and talk about what they're doing in their own hospitals and healthcare systems today. Yeah, that's great. Well, Stephen, you guys were just at an international meeting here recently, weren't you? I, I think we were talking about getting together sooner to record this. You're like, actually, I'm out of town. So tell us about that. Yeah, so actually about 10 years ago, I I was at a technology and safety meeting in Japan. And a colleague of mine who I'm now very close with, who did a lot of work on neonatal pulse oximetry with the creator of uh, pulse oximetry in Japan, Dr. Uh, Ayoagi, 
Um, and oh. he, um, we had this idea of developing a translated newsletter, but we also said it would be great if we could develop an international conference on anesthesia patient safety, where we could focus on priorities of the APSF, but exchange ideas among countries. And so that was 10 years ago. And my colleague among, it was really one of the, it's the first ever meeting that where we see the collaboration between the APSF, the ASA, the JSA, which is the Japanese Society of Anesthesiology and the Japanese Federation of Anesthesiologists. And so we hosted oh. this in the middle of February. It was a two and a half day meeting. And we talked about our patient safety priorities, which included, as you know, culture of safety, teamwork, brain health, medication safety, clinician safety, airway management, infectious disease. We had folks from Korea and Canada, the United States, Japan, all talk about their approach to COVID-19. And it was significantly different. There were some similarities, but there was a lot of exchange of ideas. So it was a fabulous meeting that we hope to write up. And we're working on that right now so that folks can understand the great ideas that we were able to learn from one another by getting together. And it's more importantly, it's the relationships that we built. I think yeah. there is a lot of long lasting relationships. What does that do for patient safety? It allows us to exchange ideas to help the patients at the bedside. So we are really excited. This was our second meeting, actually. The first one oh. was called the Anesthesia Patient Safety Symposium, which was last year in May, virtually uh, held by the Malaysian Society and other societies. And that actual meeting had over 48 countries represented and a thousand virtual members that participated in that meeting. And so that was really a huge success. And so we're going to continue to do this with our translation partners and partners from around the world to make sure that we can continue to propagate great safety ideas to improve clinician and patient safety. And it's so wonderful that whenever you have groups that get together and then you're having these sessions where there is a lot of sharing of ideas and figuring out ways to move forward and improve the way we are taking care of our patients, you all do publish that later on. And I know that there's, you know, the Stolting Conference, there's always output that comes from that, which is the local, right? The U.S. meeting? Once a year, uh, typically uh, right after Labor Day in the United States. Um, but it's focused typically on one of our safety initiatives or priorities. Yeah. And it's now available virtual as well. So we do have some virtual members that um, chime in, but it's about 130, 140 individuals and key thought leaders, primarily around the United States and, and America that come together to really look at a safety priority and develop recommendations on how we should conduct best practices with regards to uh, safety in that domain. So for instance, just last year, we developed recommendations for non-operating room anesthesia. And you and I, Desiree, had the great opportunity to talk about that at the National AANA meeting just a handful of months ago. So that was that was wonderful. And uh, I think you know we continued to do that. We also had the uh, summit on intraoperative hypotension uh, which yes. was then subsequently uh, the group that held that, which was APSF, among others, uh, developed a sort of a recommendation article that was published in December of 2023 in Anesthesia and Analgesia. So we, we really take these opportunities to convene thought leaders and partner organizations to develop recommendations on how us as clinicians can focus on improving patient safety in the perioperative space. So Steve, tell me about the, the upcoming Stolting Conference that is going to be in 2024, happen in 2024. Yes, Ezra, thanks so much for asking. It's actually, a, it's really, really a significant year. It marks the 40th anniversary of, let's say, the annual APSF conference, which originally started in 1984 and was the International Symposium on Prevention of Morbidity and Mortality. And out of that meeting of 50 representatives, came the idea of developing the APSF. So we're going to have some of the creators of the APSF that are still around talk about their experiences of creating such an organization in that meeting in Boston, uh, Massachusetts. And the actual meeting is going to be focused again on medication safety and opioid-related harm. And Dr. Elizabeth Rebello will be chairing 
the meeting. So I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you uh, will all uh, also watch out for that meeting. Um, it will be multi-professional, multidisciplinary, but we will also be recognizing those who really created the APSF 40 plus years ago. I cannot recommend those meetings enough. It is such a pleasure to go. I think whenever you can go there, it's very different. It has a very different feel than a traditional kind of conference. A lot of the times, especially whenever we're doing the consensus guidelines and statements and things like that, you really feel like you're part of this greater, you know, movement towards what, you know, what you're discussing. And that to me is super cool. And the virtual aspect to be able to do that, you still get a piece of that. So um, I would highly recommend if you haven't been to Stolting or uh, watched virtually to take this opportunity uh, this year to check it out. Because I'm sure in addition to the fa- the fabulous content around the opioid um, discussion, hearing from the creators of the APSF, that's going to be really cool. So kudos to you guys for putting that together this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. Well, we'll definitely, we're going to link everything in the show notes. So if you didn't catch anything while you're listening, no worries. It's all there. Um, Steven, I want to kind of not necessarily switch gears, but talk specifically about um, some of the aspects of patient safety. I led a uh, technology in the future of anesthesia uh, session whenever I was at the World Congress and, uh, of Anesthesiologists in Singapore. It was fascinating. Yep. And J.W. Beard, who we've talked to him quite a bit on, on Top Med Talk as well, but he was there. And one of the questions that I asked him in the panel there, and I'll talk to you about, is that, um, you know, many patients think that surgery is fairly safe these days. Yeah, I, I, and I would say that a lot of us in, as definitely team anesthesia, have, would say that over, like you said, over the last 20 years, there's been significant strides and um, gains in this space. I mean, surgery is relatively safe, isn't it? Yes and no. And it, it, okay. it largely depends on where you are and what resources you may have. And so, um, you know, in low uh, income nations or upper middle income nations, they still are lacking the amount of surgical and anesthesia personnel uh, per 100,000 uh, cases or, or folks to actually deliver the quality of care that we may see uh, in developed nations. So I think there is still a gap. Yes, for the patient undergoing surgery in the United States, generally we've had a massive improvement uh, around one in two to one in 300,000 incidents of mortality versus in the 70s and one in 10,000 or so mortality. And that's largely uh, been based on uh, leadership. It's been based on enhanced monitoring implementation of standards of care. So a lot of that has uh, really advanced perioperative safety, but we're still not there yet. And I think, you know, there are some topics that we can still do better on. Uh, communication and medical error are really tied together and are st- is yeah. still, I think, an epidemic in, in the U.S. healthcare and beyond. Um, we, yeah. uh, Dr. Warner, our past president, uh, published an article in ANA about, he surveyed a 13 countries or so about what were, what did safety mean to them and what, where were we missing and whether it was low income or upper middle income or highly developed nations, they all said teamwork, culture of safety, collaboration and communication. We can all do better in that domain. And that might be enhanced by using checklists, you know, propagating and promoting globalization of standardization. So I think there's still ways that we can sort of move the bar even more forward than the instance that we have in the United States. And there is still a disparity gap in the uh, delivery of healthcare, even within the United States in minority populations. And we saw that so evident during COVID, particularly folks in minority populations really suffered significantly from not getting the appropriate health care that they might need. So I still yeah. think we really do have an opportunity to raise the bar and improve uh, perioperative care for, for all who need it. Yeah. And it seems like we've done a really great job, I will say, you know, as far as moving technology and, and utilizing technology, specifically intraoperatively, it still seems like postoperatively we're missing 
a lot. You know, we, you and I both and a whole team, and I know Topman Talk listeners would know that we discuss intraoperative hypotension and vital sign monitoring. And we're doing that very closely. You know, we're every three to five minutes on blood pressure, but we now know there's a lot of blood pressure that you miss just in the, in that time frame. you know, think about once a patient's out of surgery and they go to a ward or the floor and they're only getting vital signs every eight hours, there is a lot of room, um, especially immediately post surgery and with our, we know higher risk patients. Let's talk about that just a little bit. Where do you feel like we're going um, in that space? I actually think, and this is really consistent with uh, John Eichhorn, who is one of the uh, you know, uh, creators of the APSF newsletter, the creator, mm-hmm. um, did a really wonderful talk at the ASA last year about standards of care. And as you know, he was one of the pioneers of developing standards of care. And, and, and what he said, and I agree with him, is that the next frontier is, is how we can leverage artificial intelligence, machine learning to capture all of this data that's being missed and then actually extrapolating it, validating it, and using it for improving patient safety. Because you're right, there's huge gap, huge gaps. We know that even when we talk about respiratory depression, that most yeah. of those cases occur one day after surgery, and most of them occur in the first few hours hitting the floor because of lack of yeah. monitoring and lack of human resources to detect these unwanted adverse events. So opportunities that I think with new focused technologies, but also integrating that technology. I don't think we can give get rid of the human to interpret no. what's going on, but I think, yeah. um, I think that might be able to serve a huge broad group of folks and also be able to look at what's happening between the interims of missed monitoring uh, events. So I think, you know, we had an actual, our last whole thing conference actually was on uh, emerging technologies. And you heard yeah. a lot about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And, and this is, it's a very, it's the probably the hottest trend. And many people believe yeah. in the next five, 10 years, there will be some type of standard or at least significant guideline on how to leverage these types of specific technologies to improve patient safety and care. But we're not yeah. there yet. There needs to be yeah. a lot of validation and transparency as it relates to how these algorithms are being built and how they're being coupled with the appropriate technology, as well as who is making sure that that output is being interpreted in the appropriate fashion, in the appropriate context, and as you suggested, appropriate timing. Yeah. It's rather interesting, you know, and we could go down so many different rabbit holes and and everything that you just said. One of the things I find really interesting is that, you know, we don't have, and and we've talked a lot about this on Top Med Talk um, with some of our different sponsors and, and a lot of our key opinion leaders that have come on. We've talked a lot about this. It's like, you know, we can have a watch that monitors our vital signs more closely and more often than what we are in postoperatively. And one of the things I am very passionate about because, you know, of past experiences being an, a nurse is seeing deterioration that is unrecognized. And, and I would just had a wonderful conversation with a surgeon, Dr. Joshi from the UK, and we were, we were discussing this and, and I, I heard um, a quote the other day. It's like, everything seems gradual until it's sudden. And, and that's, you know, that's the way it is. Everything, it is gradual uh, deterioration most of the time. And if you're switching over during shifts, like you said, or within the first four hours where they're not being monitored, you're seeing a gradual deterioration, but you're not picking up on it until it's really bad. (laughs) And this is what is a concern for me personally. And I think the takeaway that technology, the stulting last year was that we do need to know more. We need to understand the technology. There needs to be transparency, but we, we need to figure out a way that we can, you know, make this happen. And there is too much subjectivity with that process. There is a lot. Too yeah. much variability. And so we need to develop systems to take some of that out and also to take out the fear of speaking up because there's a cultural issue that goes on in many countries around the world, including the U.S., where folks are still reticent to speak up um, when they see something that is abnormal. And there, for whatever reason, it's something we still need to work on. 
And so if we develop these systems that objectively say, this is when you absolutely need to speak up, it might take that hierarchical uh, culture or failure to you know, say something's going wrong when it really is out of the picture, which really just harms mm-hmm. patients because it delays recognition and treatment or appropriate treatment. Yeah. And I think you and I, whenever we've presented at the ANA together and in other conversations, have talked about that culture of safety, not necessarily just for the patient, but for the clinician as well. And to feel safe in that you can speak up and say things. And those are just some of the skills that we haven't necessarily always talked about in the past. But it seems like there's a bit of a change in the tide, wouldn't you say? I think so. I I think, you know, and we're teaching this, we're teaching this in the early parts of school now to say, when something doesn't look right, speak up. I always, you know, when I round in the ICU, and I'll just tell you a little tidbit, I always focus on the most inexperienced person on the team. And I said, if any of us walk into a room or walk out without washing our hands, your, your job is to speak up and to tell us, stop, go wash your hands. And, you know, the first day, you know, that person is like, well, I don't know if I can do this. You're putting a lot of pressure on me. At the end of the day, by the end of the day or next day, that person is saying, Dr. Greenberg, stop. You didn't wash your hands. And so um, it builds a culture where everybody has a voice and everybody um, can watch out for one another because we're all human. We're all yeah. prone to error. And so we all need to help one another. I do think the AI machine learning when validated could take some of that out too. You could have people understand when you're washing your hands and when you're not. And you get, you know, an alert or whatever it is on your phone or your tablet to do the right thing. So there still is a way to go, but I would imagine that in the next five or so, maybe a little bit more than that year's you'll see this come down the pipeline that more and more hospitals and institutions are adopting these kinds of objective ways to early intervene patients who are going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Well, you know, Steve, I feel like the APSF and we all do feel like they do a wonderful job of informing and empowering and engaging the surgical perioperative teams. Talk to me about what you are doing with patients these days, because I know that there's been a movement towards engaging patients. Yeah, thank you, Desiree. So uh, about four years ago, we, we kind of looked at a needs assessment for the organization and figure out where we were missing sort of participation. And it was the P in APSF, patients. And so just recently, about six months ago, we uh, developed a patient engagement website, which you can get to by going to our uh, regular APSF.org website, but it really has information primarily focused on patients, on questions like, you know, what is it like to go through surgery? Will I be aware under anesthesia? What's the incidence of that? Um, How should I focus on minimizing my risk for nausea, vomiting, confusion? Um, These are common questions that we get when we deliver anesthesia care, We're trying to arm our patients with education and knowledge and a way to interact so that they can uh, sort of say, hey, these are the questions and answers that I'd like to know. And so we've seen a massive growth. We had about 100 page views in the first couple months, and now it's over 6,000. So uh, we're really excited that patients are starting to visit our website and that we can deliver some education on what actually they wanted to understand before they get to the operating room theater. And again, what we did is we really surveyed a broad-based group of patient advocates, patients, clinicians who were patients, all sorts of folks on saying, Mm -hmm. what do you want to know when you get, or even you get that call saying, I need surgery, now what? And so the common uh, frequently asked questions are on our website, uh, at the patient guide website, and uh, they have to do with surgery anesthesia and the like. And so we're really excited. We want uh, all of our patients to have a forum where they can get their questions answered. And we hope that that will provide them with those question answers. Well, congratulations on that. I, I'm thrilled to death to hear that is a, a space that you're going into in patient giving, patient facing information. We'll again, be sure to put that website and a link to that. Right. Um, I'd love for our clinicians to be able to drive you know, their patients to that site. Cause you know, I mean, there's a, you can 
meet with your patient before surgery and have the discussion um, in their families. But so much of that is lost once they leave the office because they've been through a round of, <laughs> of tests and everything else. So they need a resource. This is fantastic. Yeah. And it's growing. And so, and we actually, we are doing further surveys of patients to see what else we're missing. Because again, um, there's everything's not on there yet, um, but we hope to continue to grow yeah. and continue to engage our patients. And, that, and that's what the organization's all about, providing safe care to, to our patients. So I'm really excited about that. For all your listeners out there, if you have any comments on it, please let us know at APSF.org. So appreciate that. Congratulations to you. Thank you for all that you do. I know it's like another full-time job working on the APSF, and um, but we need passionate people like you to continue to drive these initiatives forward. Uh, it's so important um, in our space. So thank you very much. Well, I'll tell you, Desiree, it, it doesn't feel like a job to me. It, it is a passion. Yeah. And when you're passionate about something, um, you know, you just want to do everything you possibly can to make a difference. And, and that's what the APSF does, uh, for so many people. And it, like I said, it, it's a wonderful family and I, I know we will continue to do work and serve all of us as anesthesia professionals and all of our patients. So, uh, thank you for your time and your effort, uh, in, in doing this today and, and everything you do. Yeah, well, you're very welcome. And thank you guys for listening today uh, at Top Med Talk. You can find more of these types of conversations, our prior conversation that we had with Dr. Greenberg um, and other conversations about the APSF on topmedtalk.com on our website. You can find it on social media, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. We are there. And of course, any podcatcher, you can find Top Med Talk uh, on your favorite one. So check that out. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe, check us out on YouTube, and of course on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and X. Also, it's important to remember that Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EPOM, evidence based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that, and the way to do that is epom.org. Check out our website and find out about some of the incredible conferences we're going to be arranging across the year. edpom.org.